Namaste and in la catch and welcome to this episode of One World and a New World. I'm your host Zen Benefiel and as always and don't forget the meanings of those two phrases. Namaste comes from the Sanskrit ancient language spoken it's Brahmi and it means the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. In la catch comes from the other side of the world the Mayan civilization and it means I am another you. So imagine with that ancient wisdom residing in all of us, how we might be able to bring that out in our daily activities and our moment-to-moment -moment interactions with others. Think about that. Try it on. See what happens. Thanks. Well, this week's guest is Arnaud St. Paul, and he is uh, an executive coach. Uh, lead, he does leadership development and public speaking. He's the author of The Human Project. He's also, I believe, the founder of Tapwat, Tapwat, um, I think I pronounced that right, with his um, heartful leadership for everyone. And he is the founder of Give Nation, which uh, gives help to kids to support others in getting financial education. So he's done, been there, done that for a lot of places and around the world. I could talk about his introduction for a while. Let's just say he's a, a philanthropist, author, speaker, and philosopher. So, Arno, glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So, as with the uh, normal process that we have, let's th let's take a deep dive and and. It, it, even in your information, as I was doing a little research and listening to some of your videos and things like that, you had an awakening really early compared to most. At 13, I believe it was. So mm -hmm. let's start there. What was that like and how, what was going on in your life? What were the things that, uh, that, you, that prompted it? And where did it take you from there? I guess, I mean, you know, we're going through life with these all the, these different steps of development. And uh, I guess, you know, with my birth, I, I kept some of the consciousness that was prior to the birth and, and came to flourish and come, came together when I was 13. Let's and, talk about uh, that for just a moment, if I can interrupt yes. you, because that is a rare concept. It, it is out there, right? However, there's not a whole lot of talk about it so what do you mean about that so distance you know consciousness is it is all that is around us and in us at the same time and it is undefined and limited and then it becomes it becomes a human experience. That's what the, the first book I wrote, The Human Project, is about. And the second one as well. Kind of from a formless into a formable, maybe even formidable experience in some cases, right? Yeah. All right. So, so that consciousness becomes or, or is looking to become that human vessel that human identification and through what we call birth and then as we start to identify to such vehicle then consciousness starts to forget itself and become i and that i that is arno in my case uh then starts a journey towards you know through the different moments and aging mm -hmm. and all that stuff it's kind of and, like the sense the satiation of sensations until we realize that oh okay now what yes uh, now okay now what and more importantly who am i exactly so let's go back to that who am i place at 13 and, and how yeah, yeah. so right when i'm 13 starts to you know dawn on me that i held truths inside me that were more important than the truths that were offered to me in the outer world and it started in this case with religion versus spirituality not now, how, in these that, how is that sense because you know we think and we feel 
right? And there's distinction between the two. So was that a sensation that occurred that you then were able to interpret as a lack of resonance or was it something that just didn't sound, uh, I guess that's still a sensation, right? It's a knowing. It's a knowing of, you know, for me, in my own truth, God is everywhere and, and I have access to him. You know, it is me. It is all that is around me, et cetera, et cetera. And that is not something you can feel. Or yes, you can feel the truth of it. You feel the resonance of it. Well, there's a right? difference between the feeling and the sensation, I, I believe, because the feeling is the interpretation of the sensation. Yes, so there it was really a connection with the core essence yeah, uh, yeah. Of, of I or whatever is beneath the I. And, and so that was really the start of a journey where, you know, shortly after I started to be obsessed with the question, who am I? What is that experience that I'm having? And then I went on to study all the different religions, the philosophies, the practices, and, you know, with that, with that youth angst of understanding things and, and, uh, and seeing, again, truths that were emerging inside me and then finding them in books a few years after, even sometimes. Sure. Uh, and, and so that's what started the journey. And fast forward the next decades, always on that journey, always. And so while I was even, you know, in finance and technology and all that, I was also on that journey of understanding more of myself and understanding how is it to live from the heart instead of the mind? That was one of my uh, big query. And, uh, and, and started to emerge drawings so that I can have a a simple understanding of what yeah. what this whole thing is about. <laughs> right. Well, it sounds like you know you're in the process of, of bridging the inner and outer. It, yes. it hasn't been that long ago that you know, and I think I've probably known this for a while, but I read another's corroborative uh, writing that we live half inside and half outside. And so, what you're talking about is you know the that bridging where you're in the physical world and doing the activities of, of career life those kinds of things and yet there's still this you know, imposing question of who am i and yes. it starts internally and then you know it's like um the, the balance of self-actualization and self-realization yeah and, and it but it's it's becoming something where what you call outside is a reflection of what is happening inside and the only way you are living that, meaning the outside, so to speak, is as a mirror. And you are going through the reflections and you are just getting more and more marveled by who you are becoming and what it is that is mm -hmm. that life uh, that is expressing itself through you, right? It's not... Right. Cultivate, it's not a cultivation of I per se, like an egotistic point of view, but more a, um, a, a communion uh, with life, with the energy of life, the energy of flow. And, and how does that relate to the, there's another view, uh, probably a bit even more popular because that inner awareness isn't so prevalent within humanity at, at this point. It, maybe soon i hope and i think you do too that's what her life's work is about right how does this compare into what you were observing others going through simultaneously in the types of questions and searches that they were in which were probably a bit different than your own you know, this is a very tricky question mm -hmm. because the others are always a reflection of me. So therefore I cannot answer your question, but with, within that scope. Okay. <laughs> However, there is an observation that you could at least have a, um, a cursory assessment of, let's say in that reflection, understanding that at, at the deepest level possible, Yes, that, that reflection is there, and yet there are these multiple layers of 
the capacity we have to integrate that, understand it, and recognize that in others, kind of like the in-law catch, right? Indeed. How that is going and, and how that process is happening in, in others that are drawn to, into your sphere or your thought sphere, as the case may be. What I am headed towards is that these people that would observe, right, these others that I am observing are always showing an aspect of me that is looking for expression so that I can free it up and be more of me. So therefore, their concerns are, funnily enough, always in perfect matching with whatever is arising for me in that period of time. And as resonances, right, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, what I have observed were topics of related to freedom, for instance, at one point in my life and related to relationship with women. I don't know, I don't remember exactly, but et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so that all these aspects that were still uh, uh, needed attention were being shown up by the people that were working with me or you know, ran Mr. Random or, or Mrs. Random being you know, in, 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 in the uh, different aspects of life have appearing then. So the, the overall whole that has been expressed is, is that journey towards the heart and living there, living from here, living from the place of presence instead of a place of dispersion, right? And slowly getting from the individual that is looking for such endeavor to a group and a community, etc. So getting bigger in, in that idea of, of manifesting a unconditional love in the end towards oneself and towards the others. That's a powerful place to be and the presence that's there, um, we have that understanding, right? The, the knowing that it's there, it's the practice of it that really yes. kind of gets us. And in reflection of that and the, and the current times that we're in, so that, let's bring it into the, the present. We're going to, we'll jump ahead quite a bit and, and then fill in the details in between, right? Of what happened between now and then. Um, but this situation that we've had over the last couple of years where in a sense, we became afraid of each other, not just this um, event or, or whatever it was that was infiltrating our minds and bodies. And then we were put into a place of uh, obsessing on self hygiene and sequestration, which on the one hand created a lot of fear. And then on the other, it gave the opportunity for that inner inquiry to begin and be, you know, and asking the questions, you know, who am I in all of this? What yes. do I believe in? How, yeah. how do I want to behave? And how do I want to love? And how do I want to demonstrate that? What do you see as that? To me, that's a silver lining. What do you see as that transitory and transcendent period that we are in? How do you see that unfolding and, and what might we perceive as potential in coming out of it or moving further into something new? Uh -huh. Well, you know, anything that we observe in our environment is there as a contrast for us to decide which, how do we want to define ourselves related to it? So whether it is against or for mm -hmm. between quotes. And so strengthen, therefore, our sense of identity in one way or another. And the, the, the bigger the contrast, the bigger the question and, right. and therefore the choice. And, and the ability, kind of like the Taoist um, philosophy of just acknowledging and observing what is and seeking to understand that first. And then figuring out, you know, that's kind of a first brain activity, right? The gut feeling. And then 
taking that to the heart level of, okay, what are we going to do with it? Does it resonate with me? Does it not? And how can I bring that to a higher level of functionality? And, and, and maybe there's a place where we let go of trying to understand it first and we just embrace it as it is and then skip. That's only the first step actually, right? <laughs> embrace it as it is and then maybe skip to feel compassion hmm. for them, for ourselves, for how we have been reacting in the first place. And, and from that place, maybe there is still a need of understanding and maybe not. Well, is it a, a process of, of really kind of getting in touch with that sense of what is within you? And I, I get the sense that, and, and I believe that unconditional love is our natural state of being. Mm -hmm. It is. And, and, and then we build the layers upon that, that from whatever fears we may have or resistance to love. Okay. So how was that in comparison to this process we're going through of recognizing those contrasting things and being able to rise above it with some kind of uh, collaborative effort, let's say. And I realized there are some not so collaborative efforts taking place too, right? <laughs> but maybe they are just as collaborative and just in different ways. Okay, so I don't quite understand the collaborative dimension. Where do you place it? I place that in this process of the self hygiene, sequestration, going inside, coming back out, and looking for others who've done the same. Oh, okay. Sorry for again, the clarity. Again, whomever they, we are talking about is a reflection of I. So do I do does I need to see its own reflection that is doing the same or not? Is it something that is really important for it to validate its own journey? or he is trusting and in total acceptance of its own journey towards itself. So what if I is, lives in faith of its own journey towards its own heart and lives uncondition in unconditional love? Yeah. I like that faith. I, again, you know, I mentioned the Trinity fractal earlier, and, and I like the faith, love, and trust aspect and being able to put our attention, intention, and interaction toward that. Now, do you find that in that, because there's a, the, we want to seek what brings us joy and happiness for the most part, right? So, how do you see that in the process of the reflection of others and, and the growth of, of, that you see in the networking, the organizations, the virtual groups that are uh -huh. gathering and, and this overall perspective of moving towards something more than we are. And, and that, that's, that's exactly what I'm looking to, to guide people upon. And, and it's, it's all about finding coherence and harmony. And it starts with ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So within the, the, the framework that I'm suggesting that I call the heartful method, you know, everything is resonance all the time. So any thought, emotions, physical actions I may have has to be aligned. And when they are aligned, when they are in coherence, therefore all the rest, all the outer world between quotes is resonating with it and everything starts to fall into place and to I am being brought and nurtured and supported all the way where, mm -hmm. wherever is my vision uh, going towards. Kind of acquiescing so, to flow, right? Exactly. And, and in that place of I am that I am now in this moment, I may be something else down the road, but at least I am what I am here now. And, mm -hmm. and this is enough. I'm not looking to 
be something else or, or achieve this, that, this and this and that. I'm just here in tune with the flow of life. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing my best to be there for that, right? You're describing being in the present. Yes. And, and, it, and, <laughs> and it is quite precious indeed, as Augmentio would say. Um, now, how, right, these are, and I have this difficulty too, you know, we're, we're attempting to articulate a deeper level of understanding that we know is compatible with the life-friendly nature of the cosmos mm -hmm. in our own evolutionary process. And you mentioned the resonance and harmony. You know, we, how do you see harmony? And let me frame it this way. My perspective of it is that, you know, oftentimes we hear the word harmony and we think some kind of utopia, mm -hmm. uh, more so than balance. And yet, in the universe harmony, there are those conflicting kind of energies or, or seemingly so. And what we begin to recognize are the patterns within that that then emerge as an order that we may not have seen. And there was a guy in, in Canada some years ago that said, uh, he was talking with, uh, he actually ran Canada's UFO investigation program. That, funded by the Ministry of Transportation. He had conversations and one of, the, one of them, he was told that, um, you know, we don't get this anomaly thing. We see an anomaly and we try to strip it down to its constituent parts when maybe there isn't a reality or an anomaly to begin with. It's just our perception of it. Same with mm -hmm. harmony and the chaos within it and how we find order by recognizing the patterns and then it ripples through. Do you find that similar kind of process it is something that you've gone through yourself? And, and if so, then how do you reflect that to the folks that you work with? Uh, yes. The So one thing that emerged when, when you were talking is uh, this idea, so it might feel illusory to have harmony in one's life at first, in any case. Mm -hmm. But what, one has to understand that it's also always a multi layered perspective. So, whatever might not feel in balance at one level will be in balance at another level uh, by default, right? So, uh, if not, there cannot be an imbalance. It's always a game of contrast. So, the same way that we talk about change all the time. For change to happen, there is a constant that needs to be, and that constant is that core essence that we are. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, the change can happen. So once we have not understood that, but experienced it, or be in that presence in any case, then it starts to take, everything starts to get together. That sense of harmony is like, you know, when you're going to the classical concert at the beginning before the director comes in, it's everywhere, all the instruments doing their own thing, uh, and there is no harmony. And then the harmony comes together, and then it becomes a symphony. So in other words, your life, my life, is a symphony. It is. And it is looking to express itself at its best tune ever, like, like a tuning fork. Right. Now, it is my purpose to be the best instrument I can be of that as much as I can, right? But there is a need of imbalances. There is, so if you look at one moment, one note, it is an imbalance per se, because if I choose one note against another, it is an imbalance. It's choosing but one of the elimination of all others. Exactly. But when I put all of them together, all of a sudden it's a harmony mm -hmm. when it is well played. So I that's your... Go ahead. Uh, it, 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 our journey, our life is all about coming together, bringing all these instruments that are, is I... You know, the one that he was 12 years old, the other one that was 25, the other one that was five, etc., and bringing them all together in that beautiful sing of yours. Mm -hmm. Song yeah, of right. yours, sorry. It, it's, you know, the, 
how you put that and the framing it as playing in concert. Uh, I had an interview with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Mishlove several years ago, and in the flow of it, what emerged was, you know, our bodies are just instruments, and mm -hmm. we don't know how to tune them, let alone play them in concert in order to create that harmony. And I would at least ponder that the evidence we see in this transition from the way things were to where we're headed because it's still an experiment we don't know where it's all going to go because we're in, still in formation of it we're learning how to find those notes and how to play in harmony with ourselves first because if we don't do it then it's pretty much useless if we try to you know impose it on the world because it just doesn't work that way and we end up in those uh, kind of excruciatingly fun learning processes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Now, how we're talking about these levels, and, and and granted, that's something that's used kind of ubiquitously in talking about consciousness. That there's different levels, and there's also in recent years, even the last half century or so, models that have been pre presented that I find interestingly correlative and. and you know, 1950s and, and William Swigard's multiplane awareness and dealing with nine planes of consciousness and the ability we have of experiencing those. Then later on, you've got the spiral dynamics uh, model that has nine levels. And then in 2010, uh, there was a theory of everything model in, in quantum physics that was proffered. And that was uh, Nepi and Close saying that we have the consciousness, space, and time are tethered across nine dimensions for the human experience. It doesn't exclude other dimensions. It just says, this is kind of our limitations for dealing with this. Now, how does that expanded awareness of things that are available or possibilities uh, of how creation is constructed, how does that trickle down into the practical and pragmatic applications that we can apply in our lives in, in that greater understanding? So I don't know the systems you were talking about, but what, I mean, all that I share is about experience and helping. So the, that obsession of mine for the past 30 years has been to create something that I could understood that would be applicable to my life to have a, uh, to live from, from my heart and at the same time, having a, a, a beautiful human life. Right. <laughs> so it, it is about taking care of the eye and be the self at the same time. Right. That's kind of, and, that's pedantic, right? Their philosophy it's a dance. Um, yeah, it, it's the it's the indivi individuation within the unity consciousness. Mm -hmm. So there's an in essence, as we seek to find the I am in us, we have that ability to connect with and maybe find out more about a perfected form fit and function in the world because that's really what that experience is that driving us toward mm -hmm. exactly exactly and by doing so like you do it the rest of the stuff all the levels and things they don't really matter they're there because it, as you're going through the process you become aware of oh okay i made this decision here or there's another one up here that's got different parameters to make the decision within and so on and so forth depending on the so, magnitude of the Experience. To, to, to your point, uh, what I have, you know, what I help people with and, and guide them is to understand how life talks to us. And, you know, through all these events and, and uh, encounters and people that we're meeting, the others that, that are these beautiful vehicles of what is not expressed in us. And they, we can understand that, or at least uh, see the, the, the beautiful uh, symphony that it is, just this uh, series of, of uh, events, and then therefore understand what is that limiting belief system that I'm still holding to mm -hmm. so that I can release it. And when I release it, then life starts to express itself from a different standpoint where 
you can start living your life in a more expansive uh, manner from sure. a, a human perspective. Kind and of a fearless fear, vulnerability. Excuse me? Kind of a fearless vulnerability. Yes. In yes, being able to step into that. Now, in the the past, in the way the, that we've evolved over time, those kind of reflections, the articulation of them, um, has been seen as way out there and not <laughs> not real grounded in, in practicality, right? And, and yet, when you're in the midst of it, it's just the opposite. It's based yeah. in practicality. Now, how yeah. do you see being able to shift that level of conversation that's necessary to bring out that fearless vulnerability more and sharing the depths of experience and questions and concerns and compassion that we have for one another it's interesting at first you know we would have talked a few years ago uh, i would i would have said you know the people that resonate at that level of understanding start to reach out to me and we work together Nowadays, uh, groups, communities are reaching out because they have that higher purpose. And then what starts to happen is that even if the, the individuals in the groups are not necessarily at that level, they, because they start, part, first the part is they are part of that community, which helps obviously. Mm -hmm. But then we start talking about balancing the masculine and the feminine or uh, quantum physics, et cetera, et cetera. And they start getting one aspect of it. And once they do, they want to unravel the whole thing. And, and then they can enter the whole framework and start rewiring that total understanding of themselves. So uh, it, it is happening a lot faster than before and also because i'm ready for that right it's, mm -hmm. it's it's an ongoing process and uh and it's beautiful to see the transformations happening uh, for these uh, for these people because um they are ready for that too right yeah and, and not to be selfish but it's great to see it happening for us too because it, it brings that sense of fulfillment right the and embracing and being embraced uh, of loving and being loved mm -hmm. uh, and yet what you're talking about also is, is when you're looking at the networks and the organizations in this global village now i know for me recently stepping into the executive director role for live and let live foundation and global peace movement i came in with 30 chapters in 19 countries and not knowing what the leadership was and now there's a need for okay i've got to get to know them i have you know applying uh what is it covey's fifth habit of you know seeking first to understand then being understood so i have to understand where these folks are all at and then begin to help nurture that toward a collective now they all came together mm -hmm. under the premise of the philosophy of live and let live on, mm -hmm. on one side the legal side is to eliminate aggression in our laws and our legislative bodies because that's the that's where the permission for it begins, right? Mm -hmm. the, and then, then the let live side is the moral aspect of being good humans and even being better humans. Yeah. Well, what's it mean to be human? And you know, we often forget about the human being. <laughs> exactly. Right? And exactly. so we put the do before the be in the be do have scenario, right? Now, how do you see that kind of activity happening in the organizational development you're working with and the leadership of that and, and how it plays out in creating a collaborative alliance within the organization? That's, that's uh, perfect because uh, I was for two weeks hired by a, a community, a group, uh, of change makers and uh, we went on the Nile in a cruise uh, with 60 change makers and uh, the whole purpose was to bring harmony to the group coherence mm -hmm. and and we did that 
in a beautiful way um, in the sense that as we were able to work with individuals on the on the boat but also at the group level on certain aspects uh, in this case it was balancing the masculine and the feminine and trust uh, we were started to see not only the group being able to work together better but also all the different projects they had uh, uh, together, they were starting to get from outside of the boat the different inputs they needed uh, to get to fruition. So we, we saw an acceleration of the coherence and alignment happening uh, throughout the, the, the journey and, and people getting their lives changed at the same time uh, at the deepest level. Now you're talking about process, observing it, right? How do you facilitate that? Because being in your position, essentially as a facilitator, and, and I have the same thing you know, for my spiritual awakening as a teenager, I was told I was here to help facilitate a new world order and that being harmony among people and planet. So my life has been devoted to understanding, okay, what's that really mean and how can I help? <laughs> so from that place of a facilitator, what are the, the details and the, um, the nuances that you need to be aware of in order to be that best facilitator in you? Um, first, I guess it is not being in the way and let, be, let yourself be guided by the energy of the group. Now, uh, is there an agenda or a, a you know, a, whether it's an agenda, a lesson plan, or, or you know, depending on the area, um, or a, just, okay, here's where we hope to be going that you set the stage for it to happen. How is that done? No, no. It, so the, the, the purpose is to help the group find cohesion, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's always the purpose. And then uh, we had specific workshops we felt as being the core. Uh, so li listening to the energy of the, of the group, there were these two issues where one was uh, helping the, the masculine to dial down and bring up the, the feminine uh, energy so that the group encounters less resistance in its own group growth, right? Mm -hmm. and, and at the same time, helping each individual to find trust in themselves. So in other words, opening their heart to themselves. These were the two cores that were needed and it applies to everyone anyway. It doesn't really matter. And then after that, there were specific issues that just were showing up in the group that could uh, bring be brought up by a visit at a temple or a, a specific conversation that brings us to an, a, a little fine tuning that needed to happen mm -hmm. with a founder or, or or someone key in the group, and and so that things started to trickle down and and change. So, Do you have an, an illustration of, of that so that our viewers can have a little more um, depth of view in, into that experience or one, something that happened that illustrates <laughs> the process? The, the, what, what happened, so the, the, the project was a, is about building an internet of internet and one of the goals uh, was to uh, figure out the funding of the project or the, the next uh, funding of the project and initially they were looking for a way to raise uh, six million dollars and they had difficulty to figure out how and how to bring it together etc by the end of the trip, they were able to uh, not only know how to, uh, to find the funds, but they actually raised 60 million. Um, and it just happened without them looking for it, right? It's just started to flow uh, very easily. And and other projects that were part of it, like, you know, isolated projects started to get the funding as well from other sources and whatnot. Right. So, but that is only because the members of the group and the group itself was allowing this to happen. And what before they were not. Mm -hmm. 
So it's, we had to bring that end always there. It, it's phenomenal at, at how that process actually works. And one of the things that has been clear to me over the years in organizational development, working with different, different uh, fields and projects and, and the idea the actually reality that happy people get more done with less supervision mm -hmm. will far surpass your expectations when you give them the tools and let them go. And this is evident in the process that you just described yes. as to how that natural mm -hmm. inclination exponentiated the results. Yes. So that's a superb example as to, to what can happen and that that is not an isolated event. No, it's how life works if we allow it. And therein is the critical word, allow. Yes. That's the last thing that I was told before I, when I had my spiritual awakening at 18, I prayed to know what truth was and was willing to die for it. Ended up in the light beyond giving my marching orders. And, and at the end of that soliloquy of my marching orders, there were three words, trust and allow. <laughs> and then I felt a rush of energy and I was back in my body. So at that point I understood first that there was no death. And second was that we're all cosmic consciousness condensed into form, just mm -hmm. unaware of it. And that's kind of what we're talking about in, in this formless consciousness that's connected to everything, however we want to call it, more individuated within that. <clears throat> just the fact that we seem to have a physical body doesn't necessarily make it so because we're 99% space, according to science now. So that kind of makes one go, huh. But I feel solid, right? I hurt when I hit something. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I hurt when I'm feeling a lack of love. Mm -hmm. So those are two different things that we both sense and feel. And, and yet there's that space in between that manages our perceptions, I would assume without mm -hmm. being assumptive and, and just that that's where the consciousness resides. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we bring that? How do we talk about it? How do we bring it out more? How do we further the conversation so that that sense can be made common? And so that we have a common sense of, of our unity rather than our unity within the diversity. Because we still, like mm -hmm. you said, we've got to honor the diversity. And so how do we bring that unity aspect into the conversation? It's, you know, our consciousness is exploring its own like, diversity. And so it is through diversity that you can bring everyone, everyone into oneness. Because we are all unique, we all have, we all resonate with certain messages and not others. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, there are thousands of, millions and billions of pathways towards oneness and you will be inspired by one word at one moment and not inspired by the same word at another moment just to start with that right and uh, multiply that by seven billion just for this uh, timeline and then you get a, an idea of how that works right and so there's not one way well, and, and to flip that, there is one way, and, and that is the way for us, right, to integrate and find that, to tune that body, mind, spirit, soul, if you want to go there, uh, into that flow. And, you know, prior to coming here, we have that oneness, and then we come there. here and we experience the individuation in order to find the oneness again, in my opinion. Exactly, and there is all... There's only one path anyway, which is always the same. However, for you to take that path and for that other person to take that path, it will always be different. Mm -hmm. You will always enter that path in a different way related to another person, etc. And that's, that's just the way we are. And it's okay. It's perfect, actually. 
Uh, and the same way you had an, an, an epiphany at 18, someone else won't have an epiphany, but they will, you know, work very hard on their own journey at some, at first, and then they will may release that idea. They need to struggle and then they will come into the ease of themselves. And that may happen also. And that's beautiful. That's, that's pure harmony. Mm -hmm. And the so, recognition, um, so speaking of recognition, how can we perhaps have that deeper recognition to honor the paths of others and not be prescriptive in how we think they should be on that path? Well, you know what? Let's first recognize our own path and be grateful for that. See the harmony of, of this path that we have been going through and just accept it as such. Mm -hmm. And that, once we do that, then there is no more need of saying this should happen or that should happen with that individual or that individual. Do you find that those words, when they're spoken by an individual, are actually meant to be heard by them and not necessarily anyone else? Of course, always. Always. You know, the old phrase, you know, we teach what we need to learn. <clears throat> and as we point yeah. fingers... We got three of them coming back at us. So we better, you know, have at least three other perspectives from which to see a situation. It would seem anyway. And, and those things, you know, they may seem silly and, and full of nuance. And, and yet it's those little things, those little details that we can engage and embrace in our lives <clears throat> and, excuse me, and put into practice that bring out those uh, moments of joy, of awe, uh, of celebration, of, you know, the collective whoo-hoo, right? Um, because of that resonance in the activity, there, there's that upsurge in feeling connected. Mm -hmm. So how do we expand that? Uh, you, you've given some things on an individual level. How would you see that even using the, the group that you had on the Nile, um, that sound, it sounded like it went swimmingly good. Um, how would you take that and apply it on a larger scale as to what we might see or the potential evidence that we might observe that this process is happening so that it might be more relevant to the individual observer and potentially allow them to get more involved? Well, I think it's quite, it's quite blatant. Uh, when you look at how society is evolving in the past uh, 100 years, uh, when you see how quantum physics was born and what it implies, and how you saw you know, communication starting to bring everybody closer, and you, then you see internet coming together and then you see blockchain. So you, you see how consciousness is evolving from the, at the society level mm -hmm. and, and bringing about that idea of oneness. I mean, we discovered 150 years ago that, you know, these images like the one you have in your background of, of the earth. So this idea of one humanity, oneness, and now we're facing this idea that, you know, uh, the earth is getting a little bit hotter and we have to solve a few issues together. So it is happening already. And then you see impact financing and, and social impact and all that, that starts to become the flavor of the day or of the, of the decade at the very least of the decades. Mm -hmm. So it is definitely happening. There's no way, no other way. But obviously, that also triggers fears in many, many, many people. And we saw that in the last uh, uh, pandemic. And it's okay. It's part of the process, as you were saying earlier, that triggers this idea of, okay, you know, what are the questions I need to ask myself, etc. cetera. And, uh, and some will say, no, I don't want to look at it and I, I want to stay in fear. And that's, that's part of the journey too. And that's so, okay. You know, the, the, again, it's that ability to embrace others where they are and not wanting to move them. No, it's, 
every i am on my own journey and you know i'm only i can only go at the pace i can go and as long as i'm doing my best to be my best then all all is good so it is for us to to be there for everyone to the best of our abilities and then whomever wants it wants to be part of that conversation then it is part of that conversation and that's great and uh but society is evolving it is going towards more oneness each individual has the same question on their hands are they ready to live and get back to their own source their own or, or could we say live and let live right exactly <laughs> and uh getting back to their essence of oneness and and and, and self unconditional love sure now there's a, a book i read some years ago and, and uh, developed a relationship with his author dudley lynch <clears throat> he wrote some time ago organizational development book called the strategy of the dolphin then several years later he wrote another book called the mother of all minds in which he proposed that we've all got this alpha chassis and alpha mind that male, female, doesn't really matter. It's the alpha mind is steeped in competition, right? Whereas in this new millennial mindset or mind flow as the case may be, it's a beta mind still in the alpha chassis. And yet the beta mind has the ability to at least grok the term oneness. Right, that doesn't necessarily know how to work within it, and yet there's this knowing that you mentioned earlier that it exists. Now, how do we <laughs> how do we acquiesce to that? And that's really the process, right? It's not something that's for, that we push or pull energy to get to. It's a process of flow, and and when you're in that, it's a sensation to me anyway. The best term that I've found is acquiescing. Mm -hmm. too. That's it, an invitation that you just let go and allow yourself to move into. Now, how do we do that on a more effective individual level with what you understand is the nature of being? Let go of everything. Because it's, all, it's, it's only a path of easing oneself into oneself. So what does that mean on, on an experiential level? Can you give me an in instant? Letting go of your identifications of two, all the stories that you hold dear to. It is uh, the past stories, the future expectations, the, the, uh, it, you, your, our core essence is to be undefined. Okay. So what I think I hear you saying is that whenever that internal dialogue kicks in and, and you're triggered for whatever reason and you're experiencing either these past or future thought forms, to just be quiet or let them go, not, yes. not allow yourself to go into either area and become emotionally attached to them. Yes. Yes. Okay. So these are actually fairly simple practices that one might engage when they sound simple. And yet the discipline of being able to monitor your thoughts to that extent really takes some practice. You have to desire to begin with, right? And yet the practice of that, what are some, some ways that you've found work best for you and, and maybe others as well to do well, so? maybe starting to understand that all these thoughts and emotions are not necessarily you they feel like it at first they feel like they are coming from i and this is mine and therefore i have to be you know super uh, thoughtful about it and or very worried about them because they are doing this and this and that etc right but then it's also <laughs> life expressing itself through through this I of mine and so that allows me to detach from what is being expressed and it is part of I at a higher level on another level but it is also not part of it 
So what if we can look at them, you know, like when you meditation, you look at these bubbles that are coming up, the same thing in your life, and you let them flow, let them go away. They do yeah. their expression, thank you, yeah. and, 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 and love them for what they are. So, so kind of what I hear you saying is you, you carry around a great pause button. Yes, exactly. Great pause button, accepting, embracing, loving. How do you see, uh, thank you, that, that, that's very impactful and pertinent to the process, right? Um, and to be able to bring it down to that simple level for understanding and application, I think it is more important than we can imagine at this point. And, and what I seek to do with these episodes of being able to give tasty tidbits to people to help their own transcendence into a better living uh, environment for themselves, let alone others. But the others come along anyway, right? <laughs> when, you, when that happens, right? That's the ancillary effect of it, or reciprocal uh, effect, if you will. In the, the process now of determining how we interact what are some of the things that you've found are maybe most important in drilling down into that perfected form, fit, and function in the world? Because there's, there are levels of that, granted. But how do we, or how might we, begin to perceive that perfected form, fit, and function in ways that make sense to us without necessarily having that expanded awareness? I'm sorry, I do not understand the question. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> it was formulating as it was happening, so I'm not sure that I understood the question fully. <laughs> um, that's the nature of a puppet, apocalyptic chat. So in this process, what are some of the things that we can tune into to help make that understanding of the access or the reality of a perfected form fit and function in the world mm. and so that has multiple layers right so how does how can we drill down into those significant layers and find something that then emerges into the outer world as a maybe even a, a slight change or sometimes even a sweeping change in how we're interacting with the world Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to make a little more sense. Uh, slightly. Okay. So the answer that shows up is uh, let's try not to understand, but to be guided and trust what comes and trust also whichever outcome may be expressed at that moment by me. And... He, in other words, replacing understanding by trust and faith. And that will lead a long way towards more such one oneness mm -hmm. right? and getting to a place of, of allowing what is. Again, right. same thing. We're circling back to it. Well, in the example that I just demonstrated, right, I went into my head to try to formulate that question, which is a very intellectual place without much sensitivity, right? When the body and, and the nature of the being is to be highly sensitive to the vibrations. So mm -hmm. there it is that, that, and that maybe that's where you felt the disconnect too, right? Not yes. that it was a disconnect, but it was a different place from which you heard it and then you brought it back into the the body being if you will mm -mm -mm. So yes. thank you for that thank Wonderful you Wonderful game to play isn't it yes <laughs> and to be aware that it's happening and, and just to be able to say oh yeah we just did this and here's the example and you know and so those are kind of the things of letting go and just being mm -hmm. able to observe and talk about what's going on mm -hmm. yeah completely it's fascinating <laughs> and so rewarding too because even though you know uh, for instance we didn't know each other from adam mm -hmm. or Eve to begin with 
and we've had this wonderful conversation about how life has evolved for both of us in, in very similar ways and, and with very similar understanding that we're applying differently because we're working with different people. And, and yet, you know, when we first came on, it's like, a, you know, hey, brother from another mother. <laughs> um, and there's that sense of resonance in that place too, even though we may not use the same terminology, language, semantics, whatever, uh, mm -hmm. in, in our ways of, of describing things. And yet that's like in the um, evidence of your group, would you say that that's kind of what occurred to them is, is they got beyond all of that in order to find that place of oneness within the group that emerged in, in how that um, six to 60 mm -hmm. process took place, right? Yeah. Uh was not necessarily a conscious uh, realization for each individual to be wanting to be in focused or in alignment with the group, but it, it definitely was what was happening anyway. So oh, a, a deeper level there to be unfolded at the sure. group levels and down the road. Kind of the personal faith, love and trust mm -mm. point. Yes. Right. And then the rest of it, just being in the present moment worked. Mm. Yes, because there was an overall, and I, I think that there's an example of this and a lot of things. That, and let me pose this question to you: Do you feel that in the energy of something, when there is a group activity to focus attention, intention, and interaction, do you think there's a larger thought, atmospheric activity that's taking place in order to? facilitate that happening there is a definitely a group energy that exists and, and basically within that uh, that journey we did cater to the need of that energy uh, consciousness i guess the consciousness of the group were there moments that you or others in the group acknowledged that greater it possibility did not need to do so we did as facilitators um, and we worked at that level, but they didn't know they don't have to have the consciousness of it. They are part of it. So sure. it's, it's difficult for them to detach from that. Well, and, and in any case, you know, much like a division of labor, right? Where you, there is a hierarchy, not everybody has to be on the same page, but enough have to be at least on that first page that the book makes sense. Yes. And exactly. the, by doing, by stepping into those. Uh, places that you can make sense out of the book and, and the book actually unfolds on its own. Yeah, yeah, totally. Totally. Cool. Mm -hmm. So if you were to have a tasty tidbit of advice for our viewers as to how they might um, embrace what we've been talking about, put it into practical practice in, in their own lives, what might that be? Well, from a very pragmatic standpoint, they could potentially go to our website, tapwatcom slash harmony. And there there's a, a list of different workshops where they can go through it's free. So they don't have yeah. to pay for anything. And that may, you know, start them on a, on a specific journey. Cool. I'll uh, also have that in the description of the okay, chat as well. Thank you. And, uh, and besides that, I guess, you know, this journey we're talking about is about simplicity. It's about getting back to our essence and it's getting back. It's not moving towards or struggling or hustling towards that. It is really allowing ourselves to be embraced by ourselves. And so let's do it. Yeah. Let's allow yeah. that to happen. So that's where the, the push and pull don't have a significance anymore and the flow is actually what's emerging that was always there before. Yes. We're just allowing it to happen. Yes. Amazing journey. Phenomenal for some. Spooky as hell for others. <laughs> right? So best we can do is embrace each other and, and help the process along whenever we have the opportunity. Right? Yes. Thanks so much for your time, Arno. This Thank is you. such a pleasure and our serendipitous synchronistic meeting. 
that <laughs> brought this about. I am so thankful and, and grateful for as I am with all life and whatever it has for us in any so way. I. I know that. And thanks so much for being here and for sharing your insight and wisdom. Uh, I'm sure the audience will benefit greatly from it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And namaste and in la catch. And thank you for sticking with us for this episode of One World in a New World and the ap apocalyptic, easy for me to say, and the apocalyptic moments that it may have held for you. I know it did for me, and I appreciate that. So for now, I'll see you next time.